Right now on Morning News Now, the clock is ticking for TikTok. The House overwhelmingly approving a bill that could ban the popular app here in the U.S. But how will it fare in the Senate? And what could it all mean for TikTok's millions of American users? Savannah will break it all down. Also this morning, major developments in former President Trump's election interference case in Georgia. The judge dismissing three of the counts against him. We'll explain what's behind that decision as the former president heads to a Florida courtroom today for a different case. Plus, a promising medical breakthrough that might shape the way doctors detect colon cancer. The new research that shows lives could be saved with a simple blood test. And swiping left, why some of the big dating apps are on the decline among younger Americans. The Gen Z trends that have them looking for love elsewhere. Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. Going to be back here in New York with you. Good to have you <laughs> with us. I'm Joe Fryer. We're going to start with TikTok's time in the U.S. possibly running out. A bill that could ban the popular social video app cleared the House yesterday. Yeah, that's right. Actually, they overwhelmingly passed it with strong bipartisan support and a 352 to 65 vote. So this is called the Protecting Americans from Foreign Adversary Controlled Applications Act. The legislation says TikTok is a threat to national security because it is controlled by China, a foreign adversary. The company maintains it is not controlled or owned by the Chinese government. Well, this bill essentially gives tech giant ByteDance, that's TikTok's parent company, two options. Either sell the app to a buyer approved by the U.S. government within six months or forgo a sale and be banned in the U.S., TikTok CEO Shozi Chu posted a video last night speaking directly to the app's users and expressing his disappointment. This bill gives more power to a handful of other social media companies. It will also take billions of dollars out of the pockets of creators and small businesses. It will put more than 300,000 American jobs at risk and it will take away your TikTok. We will not stop fighting and advocating for you. We will continue to do all we can, including exercising our legal rights. So a potential ban could be devastating for small business owners and creators who use TikTok to earn their living. Several well-known TikTok creators have already started looking for ways to diversify their businesses and brands. So now what's next? The bill heads to the Senate where it faces an uncertain future. So you were there yesterday on Capitol Hill as the vote went down. And that's the big question. What happens next? Leaders of the Senate Intelligence Committee have already endorsed this. Is that a sign of what could happen in the Senate or does it face a tougher road here? Yeah, so the leaders of that committee, they put out this statement essentially praising the bill, praising the fact that the House had passed the bill and then also urging Senate action, saying we should do this, we should bring this to the vote. The thing, though, is, is that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has been very noncommittal about actually bringing that to a vote on the floor. It is unclear if or when he would do so. We also have heard just anecdotally from senators more negativity than we did from representatives, several of them pointing out the fact that is it really a good idea to mess with something young voters specifically love? Dick Durbin actually has been saying, does that really sound like a good re-election strategy? It's, of course, on the back of everybody's minds that it's 2024 at the same time this fight is going down. So if it is approved by the Senate, the president would have to assign it. We, we know that he uses TikTok in his campaign. At the same time, it sounds like he probably would sign it. Where do things stand with the president? Yeah, it's a great question because he is posting, I mean, as recently as this week, he is fully using the app while this conversation is going on in the background. I actually spoke with several Democratic representatives yesterday who said that is a mixed message. I, I don't like that. It's not clear why the president would be using the app that he seems to believe, as well as many members of Congress do, could potentially be a national security threat. He has, though, said should this make it to his desk, he would sign it. It. Of course, that still passes the big hurdle that I just laid out in the Senate. Unclear if it will make it to his desk. If it does, that's when that six-month time starts for ByteDance to divest this company. And if not, in theory, is the theory is that it would just essentially disappear from app stores, be unavailable on your phone. But TikTok will likely challenge that in court should it get to that point. That's the other part of this as well. Yeah. It's a huge <laughs> issue for tens of millions of people who use TikTok. And make their right. money on it. And much more to come. All right, Savannah, thank you so Absolutely. much. Now to a major development in the Georgia election interference case against former President Donald Trump. Yeah, Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee has dismissed three of the counts against Mr. Trump, but it's important to note he still faces 10 other counts in the Georgia case. For more, we are joined by NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delanian. He is in Fort Pierce, Florida. We also have NBC News Legal Analyst Danny Savalos here on set with us. Ken, I'll get started with you there in Florida. What can you tell us about the charges that were dropped? 
Good morning, Savannah and Joe. Six counts total, three of which apply to former Biden. President Trump. Not against Biden. And uh, essentially what the judge Start decided Biden. here is that these uh, counts did not allege sufficient violations of the Biden. Georgia and U.S. constitutions. I know, and I need that was the issue, uh, not the overt acts that were alleged. Charged this involved uh, the alleged acts by Mr. Trump and I'm his co-defendants to pressure Biden. local officials over bogus Biden. allegations of fraud. And again, the indictment is still in place. Most of the charges are still in place. But these particular charges have been dismissed and Biden. the prosecution no could appeal this ruling. All right, Danny, let's bring you in here. Why did the judge decide to drop these three charges? Was this a mistake in your mind by the DA to even bring them in the first place, or was this kind of a surprise? No, this was an unforced error in a sense. This is called a demure. Basically, what you do, and it exists in civil and criminal law, you say, look, take a look at the charging instrument. Here are the four corners of that instrument. Uh, did they allege properly the crimes? Did they give us sufficient notice of what we have to defend against? These motions are almost always denied. They're very difficult for the defense to win because the pleading standard is really very light. But this is not your ordinary robbery or burglary case mm -hmm. that is charged thousands of times in that a, uh, the DA's office would know how to allege the facts. Instead, here, this is a complex case. And what the judge found is that there was an allegation that uh, people solicited the violation of oath of office. But they didn't articulate the state what part of that oath of office specifically was solicited. So when you do that, you really have two things you have to prove. You have to prove the solicitation, or allege it, I should say. And you also have to allege the elements of this oath that was violated. So it really was, in my view, a, uh, an unforced error because it's something that they just needed to allege with more specificity. They could do it again, arguably. That's really all these motions really win you. They may just win you more time as the state or the government goes back and gets the proper indictment. But, you know, any win on the defense that slows things down for the Trump team uh, and the co-defendants is a win. Absolutely. Ken, we're also watching for a decision on whether or not D.A. Willis will be disqualified from the case. Fannie Willis, do we have any idea when that ruling could come down? It could come down any day now, Savannah. And this is really much more important than the other decision we're talking about, because if she is knocked out of this case, it could be the end of the case. It would fall to a state prosecution board to decide who would replace her as prosecutor. And that board moves notoriously slowly. Now, if he does, if the judge does rule that she has a conflict of interest here, and this involves the hiring of a person that she had a romantic relationship with, uh, she may be able to appeal that ruling. And that could allow her to remain in the case. But again, that would cause a big delay. So uh, either way, uh, unless the judge completely absolves her and decides she can remain in the case, this could be a very difficult situation Criminal. for this case Criminal. and for the prosecution, guys. All right. So, Danny, let's talk about why Ken is in Florida right now. And that's because we're going to have this hearing today about the classified documents case that impacts Mr. Trump there. What could we expect in that hearing today? We know that Mr. Trump and his legal team, they'd love to have this case thrown out, at the very least delayed, right? Yeah, courts are very reluctant to throw cases out and deny the government their day in court, even more so, I would expect, uh, in cases of this importance, arguably the most important criminal cases in American history are all pending at the same time, including in the Southern District of Florida. The argument is basically uh, trying to boil this complex issue down to a simple explanation is really that the Presidential Records Act and the president's status as president allowed him a special privilege to sort of designate documents as not classified. That and some other arguments that they're making to throw the case out. It's a legal issue that the court can decide at this stage. but. No matter the outcome, we already know what we're going to see. We're going to see a number of appeals. Now, whether or not those appeals can stall the pending criminal case, uh, that's another legal issue. But these are legal issues the court can decide at this stage. It's just practically they almost r never will decide these in favor of the defendant because it means denying the state or the people or, in this case, the government, the federal government, the prosecutors, uh, their trial in court. So we love when you make a prediction for us, if not thrown out. I mean, at the very least, is this delayed, do you think? Uh, it, if the appeal, the problem is interlocutory appeal in criminal cases uh, usually doesn't uh, stall the underlying criminal case. There's a good reason for that. We saw that earlier in one of the other Trump cases, the D.C. case. There's a reason we have that rule, because if every criminal 
uh, or a criminal defendant could stall his case mm -hmm. by simply appealing, then no cases would ever go to trial. You'd right. be 20 years down the road in the appellate process, and the original trial never would go forward. So, uh, look, it, predictions, I'm usually wrong, but if I were guessing, <laughs> the, uh, the court is not likely to grant this motion mm -hmm. simply because they want the government to have their day in court. You don't want to be that judge uh, that denied that opportunity to the state, the people, or the mm -hmm. federal government. All right, Kendall Indian and Danny Savalas, thank you both. Legal challenges are not the only thing on former President Trump's mind. After clinching the GOP nomination earlier this week, speculation is growing over who he'll pick for a running mate. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns has new exclusive reporting that shows Mr. Trump is focused on abortion as he considers the other half of his ticket. Former President Trump's search for a running mate coming into sharper focus. And one issue dominating the discussions, abortion. We're living in a time when there has to be a little bit of a concession one way or the other. And I think, uh, you know, I want to get, get it right. Multiple sources telling NBC News Trump views abortion as a singular liability for Republicans in November and is screening candidates for a running mate for possible vulnerabilities on the issue. Trump even reportedly surveying his own guests at Mar-a-Lago about potential VP picks and their views on abortion. For 54 years, they were trying to get Roe v. Wade terminated, and I did it, and I'm proud to have done it. Trump's three nominees to the Supreme Court were critical in overturning Roe v. Wade, but he now blames recent Republican losses on what he sees as the party's poor messaging on reproductive rights. Since the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe in June 2022, abortion rights have gone virtually undefeated in ballot measures from coast to coast. And polls show voters trust President Biden over Trump on the issue. Trump now determined to make sure his ticket doesn't face the same fate. Can a change in messaging to be more moderate really have an impact? Republicans have yet to find that silver bullet or that tightrope that they can walk that gets them suburban voters but also doesn't alienate or disassociate themselves from, from past positions. Among the top VP candidates, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, a former 2024 rival who has since endorsed and campaigned with the former president. But his hardline stance on abortion has some concern in Trump world. I would literally sign the most conservative pro-life legislation that they can get through Congress. South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem also on the list and also under scrutiny after her state's trigger laws went into effect when Roe was overturned, instituting a near total ban. Nome defending those laws, which do not have exceptions in the cases of rape or incest. In an interview with CNN, Nome was asked about the possibility of a 10-year-old rape like victim this. seeking abortion that. treatment. In South Dakota, the law today is that the abortions are illegal except to save the life of and the mother. Be because I don't believe a tragic situation should be perpetuated by another tragedy. New York Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, currently in House leadership and considered a rising star in the party, has expressed support for a different approach, a 15-week national ban with exceptions. We stand for life, we are proud to stand for life, and we will oppose this very radical anti-life agenda that we're seeing from House Democrats. The New York Times reports Trump supported a 16-week ban in private, a claim his campaign denies. As Trump seeks to walk a fine line between appealing to the majority of Americans who support some abortion rights without alienating the pro-life base that's critical to his campaign. Our thanks to Dasha Burns for that report. The former president has not given a timeline on when he'll select his running mate in 2016. He announced Mike Pence as his VP pick in mid-July. Now to Oklahoma, where we're getting new details about the death of Nex Bennett, a transgender student. Last month, a medical examiner's report has ruled his cause of death as suicide. The report released yesterday cited the probable combined toxicity from two drugs as the cause of death. One of the drugs is available over the counter, the other by prescription. The 16-year-old who used they and he pronouns died February 8th, a day after he was involved in a fight at school. Nex reportedly told his mother that he was bullied at school because of his gender identity. If you or anyone you know is struggling, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. It's day two of jury deliberations in the case against the father of a Michigan school shooter. James Crumbly faces four counts of involuntary manslaughter for his alleged role in the attack that killed four teenage students at Oxford High School. NBC News correspondent Adrian Broaddus has the latest as we wait for a verdict. 
A jury has started deliberating whether to convict James Crumbly of involuntary manslaughter and make him the first father to be held criminally responsible for a school shooting committed by their child. James Crumbly is not on trial for what his son did. James Crumbly is on trial for what he did and what he didn't do. You heard testimony from over a dozen witnesses. None of them told you that James knew what his son was planning. His wife, Jennifer, found guilty on the same charges last month in her own landmark trial. I mean, it was just, it was chaos. The prosecution calling so, many of the same witnesses this time boy, around, oh, yes. arguing James Crumbly didn't do enough to stop Ethan from killing four students at Oxford High School in 2021. The most precious in my mind was his smile. He had those braces on for a long time, and he had literally just got them off um, a couple months before. James Crumbly was presented with the easiest, most glaring opportunities to prevent the deaths of these four students, and he did nothing. A key issue, how James Crumbly stored the gun, purchased a few days before the mass shooting. He's Prosecutors reading excerpts from Ethan's journal, saying in part, quote, I will have to find where my dad hid my 9 millimeter before I can shoot up the school, Ethan wrote, and saying, quote, I have zero help for my mental problems, and it's causing me to shoot up the expletive school. Unlike his wife, James Crumbly did not take the stand, and the defense called just one witness, his sister, Karen, who took the stand today. Your nephew never wrote you a note that said, help me. No, sir. And he never drew a picture next to that note with a gun, did he? No. After four days of testimony, another landmark case is in the jury's hands. Seeing the evidence and seeing the testimony says enough for itself. And just seeing us there as a present uh, for our children, it, it says enough. Our thanks to Adrian Broaddus for that report. Well, as is often the case, we've got some wild weather to get to. It might feel like spring in the northeast, but it is still very much winter out west. Right now, Colorado is being hit with its biggest snowstorm in three years. Overnight snow started falling at a rate of two to three inches an hour. Forecasters say Denver could get maybe up to 20 inches. Other parts of the state could see as much as three to four feet. On top of all that snow, wind gusts of up to 40 miles an hour are making travel nearly impossible. Airlines are telling passengers to double check their flight statuses and rebook if possible. And on the ground, officials closed several stretches of Interstate 70. Rescue crews ready to save any stranded motorists. Let's get more on all this from meteorologist Angie Lastman. She's tracking the snow headed for the Rockies and just how much. Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Yes, we've got wintry weather for folks across the Rockies and that same storm system also going to leave us with the potential for some severe weather today. Let's start with the winter alerts, though. Five million people included in those right now. And you can see that heavy snow continues stretching across much of Colorado. We've got Fort Collins, Boulder, Denver, Colorado Springs all dealing with the heavy snow really impressive snowfall rates that we're expecting through the day today. And because of that, totals are going to be impressive in some spots. We've got the potential for the front range to pick up anywhere from three to four feet. Those are going to be on the higher ends of some of those totals. You can see Boulder anywhere from 12 to 20 inches. We've got Denver up to 18 inches by the time we get through tomorrow. And again, it's not just the, the heavy snow that's going to be problematic. We've also got those wind gusts up to 40 miles per hour. So whiteout conditions are going to be likely. Uh, Denver airport is going to be difficult to travel in and out of here for the next couple of days. Meanwhile, I mentioned the severe storms that we're watching. We've got a th thunderstorm watch in effect, and that's going to go until 12 o'clock. You can see St. Louis included in that, parts of Illinois, as well as that system starts to march to the east. Here's what we're expecting through the day today and into tonight. The greatest threat is going to be later into the day and into the evening hours, and you can see right where we're looking at the bullseye. It stretches from Texas all the way up into portions of Ohio, but Indianapolis, St. Louis, Dallas, all included in that, Memphis as well. Uh, but Folks across portions of Oklahoma and Arkansas are going to see that chance for us to, to pick up some large hail. That's going to be the biggest threat. You can see that stretches into parts of Indianapolis and down to Dallas. Uh, we won't rule out some strong wind gusts, too, and a couple of tornadoes. We're not done with the storm system just yet as we get into tomorrow either. Those thunderstorms will increase in intensity actually as we get through the morning hours and in the afternoon hours and we'll once again be looking at a, a severe threat. It'll be a lot smaller tomorrow, but it's still there, especially across parts of Texas. Otherwise, some thunderstorms will be possible across the southeast and into the southern plains. Those same threats will be possible, specifically the two-inch hail uh, across, again, Texas. Now, looking ahead to the weekend, notice your Friday showers and the mild 
conditions from the northeast to the southeast, but the northern tier of the country, that's where uh, the milder conditions are, and that's where you'll also find some sunshine, guys. We head into Saturday with more mild highs across much of the east. Wow. I like to see that. Yeah. <laughs> a mixed bag. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Angie. Sorry. Much more to come on this hour of morning news now, including a new way to screen for colon cancer with a simple blood test. The breakthrough research that could help save lives. But first, we have boots on the ground in Haiti this morning, with the U.S. now sending a team of Marines to protect its embassy there. We've got the latest as the Caribbean nation descends into chaos. That's up next. Stay with us. We are back now with the latest on the spiraling crisis of violence in Haiti. The U.S. is sending in a new contingent of Marines to guard the embassy as Americans, including a best-selling author, are making harrowing escapes. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez reports from neighboring Dominican Republic. With Haiti in utter chaos, a new team of U.S. Marines has been sent to help protect the American embassy. This is what hell on earth sounds like. A nighttime gun battle in Port-au-Prince captured on a terrified bystander's cell phone. Another woman, Haitian-American Cherie Bell-Humer, says an armed gang kicked her out of her home and threatened to kill her if she went back. We are so frightened for our lives. We can never go back home. She's now desperately trying to escape and meet up with her family in Miami. But the border and the airports are shut down. Also suddenly trapped, best-selling author Mitch Album visiting an orphanage as charity runs in Haiti. You can't go anywhere, you know, you can't get out. That's how Haitians live every single day. Then a harrowing escape, a stealth private helicopter mission rescued Album and orphanage staffers. You know, the fear is that the gangs are going to shoot at the helicopters. That's, uh, they, they, they've done that. And we we're all on top of one another, not in seats, just a big ball of humanity. And the door closed, and within 60 seconds, we were up in the air in the dark and, and, and flying. Haiti's prime minister yeah. just said he'd step down as soon as a new interim government took over. But a notorious gang leader known as Barbecue is calling for civil war. Here in the neighboring Dominican Republic, the government is stopping desperate Haitians from coming. And in Florida, the governor is already deploying extra law enforcement and drones in anticipation of a possible migrant influx from Haiti. Gabe Gutierrez, NBC News, Santiago, Dominican Republic. More international headlines now. We start with the latest on the conflict raging in Gaza. Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and more. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, guys. That's right. The United Nations Agency for Palestinian Refugees say that one of its staff members was killed and 22 others were injured after Israeli forces hit a food distribution center in the southern Gaza Strip. Now, according to the agency, the distribution center was hit despite having shared their coordinates with Israel's military. The Israeli Defense Forces say it was a precise strike which eliminated a Hamas commander. Now to Australia's Victoria State, where a 27-year-old man died and another was seriously injured after rocks collapsed inside an underground gold mine. Authorities said 29 workers at the site were rescued as they took refuge in a safety pod when the accident happened. The mine has been shut down while the police and local safety regulators investigate what happened. And we end up in Denmark, which has started calling up women for military service as it boosts its army. The plan is to extend military conscription to women and also increase the standard service time. The Danish Prime Minister said they are doing this not because they want war, but because they want to avoid it. The change marks, uh, makes Denmark the third country in Europe to introduce female conscription in the army. Back to you guys. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Coming up, a huge potential advancement in the way doctors can screen for colon cancer. After the break, can a simple blood test actually save more lives in the face of rising cases? Our Dr. John Torres is looking into it. Doctor is in next. We're back with the results of a promising new study that could dramatically increase and improve colon cancer detection. This is important because the number of colon cancer cases in the U.S. continues to rise. According to the New England Journal of Medicine, research shows a simple blood test may be able to detect early signs of colorectal cancer. The doctors say the technology is a major step forward in this screening process. NBC News medical contributor Dr. John Torres joins us now with more on this. 
correspondent. Good to have Good you morning. with us. So walk us through how this compares to other screening, screening methods for colon cancer. Why do doctors think this is so promising? And the reason doctors think this is promising and the reason it's hitting the news is, like you mentioned, a study showing that it's accuracy 83 percent. Oh. It's very accurate at detecting colon cancer in those early stage cancers, which is all important. And what we wrote, know right now is it is comparative to the other ones that you have at home, which are called the FIT test, the Cologuard tests. The difference being those are stool tests. This is a blood test. And that's the big difference. And what they think is going to happen is this is going to drive people towards getting this blood test that didn't want to do the stool test or aren't getting the colonoscopy. And that's probably the biggest advice saying this does not replace the colonoscopy, but is an additional tool to the colonoscopy. Yeah. And in fact, I think on this point, correct me if I'm wrong, though, the test found 83 percent of the cancers. However, it found a few of the pre-cancer with gross growths, excuse me, that could be found in a colonoscopy. Does that mean maybe it's not like a good tool for early detection and that that's still an important part of care? So it's the shield blood test by Garden Health is the one we're talking about. And what they say is, you know, 45 and above with average risk of colon cancers are the ones that should be looking at this. And you can see the early signs of colon cancer right there. Uh, the other one would be changes in your stool if you have issues with that. And that's another thing to look at. But the, the biggest thing is to remember that this is detecting early stage colon cancer because it uses DNA in the blood. What happens is a tumor puts out DNA when it starts shedding, gets into the blood, and the blood test can detect that DNA. Polyps don't necessarily do that mm. because they're early on, and that's why a colonoscopy is that gold standard because they can actually visually see the polyps, remove them, and test them. So doctors are struggling to get people to screen, even though we are seeing younger people get more colon cancer. We know the screening went down, the colonoscopy to 45, but talk about how important screening is and could this blood test play any factor in trying to get that and, up? And screening is, ex is, is so important. And you'll hear people tell time after time about how something happened, they ended up getting a colonoscopy for whatever reason or having one of those blood tests that led them to a colonoscopy and they found it early and they were able to take care of it, cure it, and get them back to their normal lives extremely important and the problem is right now colonoscopy only 50 to 60 percent of people are getting colonoscopies if you add the other tests we still have that segment of the population that's not getting those tests and so they think this will fill the gap and that's the important thing to understand that what this is doing is saying if you get this it's positive then you go to a colonoscopy at that point to make sure that that's what the diagnosis is and then you get treatment if you have colon cancer but you get it early which can save your life and quickly what would you say to people who are worried about a colonoscopy they don't like the sound of it yeah it's not as bad as you think. I've had colonoscopies before. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's fine. And, and it's, it's the thought of it happening is, is worse than actually doing it. The prep is something prep. that people don't like. Once you get through the prep, which you know is not that bad, then the colonoscopy, you don't even really think much about it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Dr. John, thank right. you so much. Appreciate it. Great to see you. Well, a traditionally conservative town in Oklahoma is facing a political reckoning. A small group of locals have forced a recall vote against a city commissioner who attended events supporting white nationalism. NBC News senior reporter Brandy Zadrozny takes a closer look at the fallout. Terrible. It's an unusual meetup on a Monday night in Enid, Oklahoma. The location is secret. Somebody minds the door for security. A small group determined to change their city. Everybody in this room played a role. Among those here are 69-year-old Connie Vickers. I was born and raised here in Enid. And 74-year-old Nancy Presnell. I've lived here most of my life. They're best friends and Democrats, rare in the deeply conservative county. Both retired, but hard at work. How many doors did you knock on? I don't know. Yeah, it was a lot. Enough to get the signatures needed for a recall election of City Commissioner Judd Blevins. This is Judd Blevins in 2017, tiki torch in hand in Charlottesville, Virginia, marching alongside avowed white supremacists and neo-Nazis. I saw the picture of Judd Blevins with the tiki torch, and I was like just shocked. The more they looked, the more they found. Blevins had been an active leader in the white nationalist group Identity Europa. According to an analysis of photos, biographical details, and other information, Blevins hid his white nationalist identity behind the online moniker Conway. In private online forums reviewed by NBC News, Blevins, as Conway, posted racist messages and praised Hitler. And yet, when the former Marine ran for city commissioner last year as a conservative Republican... He won by 36 votes. Yes, yes, yes. Now, 
Now, Presnell and Vickers are part of the Enid Social Justice Committee, vocal opponents of Blevins since he took office. The group mincing no words on its website, saying Enid has a Nazi problem. A lot of people don't want to say the word Nazi, but when you see what he did and what he's involved with, you know, it's not name calling, it's what he is and what he believes. We wanted to ask Blevins what he believes for ourselves, but he denied our multiple requests for interviews. We tried once more outside a city council meeting. Can I ask, you are a leader in an Oklahoma chapter of a white nationalist organization, and I want to know if you have any explanation to that. Come here, come here, come here. No. Then why did you march and unite the Excuse right? Me. Why did you hold a tiki torch and march as people did, say Jews will not replace us? Pre- I've been a conservative all my life. Cindy Allen was editor and publisher of the Enid News and Eagle when Blevins won. Her paper had published a front page story about his past prior to the election. Blevins called it a hit piece. We followed up uh, many times and he never would answer us. And yet he won. <laughs> He won. There's an opportunity now to address what kind of tolerance of extremism this community is going to have. Enid's mayor, David Mason, also a conservative Republican, says behind closed doors, Blevins admitted to his involvement in white nationalist activities. And my follow-up question was, are you still involved with those groups? And he told me, I do not have to answer that question. And my, my thought was, you just did. Blevins' opponent in the recall election, set for April 2nd, is a Republican, too. She didn't want to talk about the race with us, a race that most here see as squarely about Blevins. If we vote him in a second time, that probably says a lot about about who we are. That identity is exactly what Vickers and Presnell are working for. National white supremacist organizations have called you two outrageous Antifa commandos. (laughs) <laughs> badge of honor. What happens if you don't win? We keep putting up a fight. <laughs> we're, we're not going to put up with it quietly. Fighting, they say, for the soul of their city. Brandy Zadrasny, NBC News, Enid, Oklahoma. Coming up, a battle of the exes. It's a media smackdown that's pitting former CNN anchor Don Lemon and Elon Musk against each other. This morning, more on their testy one-on-one interview and Lemon's deal with Musk's ex. That's now toast. Stay with us. This is Morning News Now. We're back now with disturbing accusations about what was going on behind the scenes of some of the most beloved Nickelodeon shows of the 90s and early 2000s, including All That, The Amanda Show, and Drake and Josh. A new docuseries is shining a spotlight on claims of discrimination, sexism, and sexual abuse. NBC's Stephen Romo has the story. They were massive TV hits for kids in the 90s and early 2000s. Nickelodeon shows like Drake and Josh, iCarly, All That, and more. Nickelodeon was kid everything. And you better hope that your house had cable. Quiet on set, The Dark Side of Kids TV is a new investigation discovery documentary series raising disturbing allegations about some of these beloved shows and the people behind them, like powerhouse creator and producer Dan Schneider. Business Insider first reporting on some of these allegations in 2022, but the new series delves deeper with interviews from some on and off camera team members. Two women writers on The Amanda Show starring Amanda Bynes say the production was a hostile work environment for women, accusing Schneider of telling them that women aren't funny. There are also accusations of sexual abuse against members of Schneider's staff. A major accusation that came to light in a new teaser trailer, actor Drake Bell, co-star of Drake and Josh, coming forward as an alleged sexual abuse victim of dialogue coach and actor Brian Peck, who was convicted of child sex abuse back in 2004. The minor, who was previously identified as John Doe, is said to be Bell in the docuseries. One of our reporters got an advanced screening of Bell's accusations. He asked the producer to essentially imagine the most horrible form of sexual abuse possible. And that's what happened to him. 
Bell has faced disturbing charges of his own. In 2021, he pleaded guilty and was sentenced to two years probation for felony child endangerment and a misdemeanor charge of disseminating harmful material to a juvenile after a woman says Bell attempted to groom her when she was 12. In the documentary, he kind of said that he took responsibility for that. What this documentary kind of highlights with those two cases juxtaposed with each other is that a lot of times there's a cycle of abuse. A spokesperson for Schneider told NBC News that he was the biggest champion for child actors on these shows and said that an investigation by Nickelodeon after Schneider's departure found he was a challenging, tough and demanding person to work with, nothing else. These revelations, a stark contrast from the happy-go-lucky shows they stem from. Our thanks to Stephen Romo for that report. For its part, Nickelodeon says it cannot corroborate or negate these allegations from decades ago, but the network says it has adopted new safeguards since that period. Well, former CNN anchor Don Lemon said that Elon Musk canceled his new talk show on X before the first episode even premiered. Lemon says his deal with the social media platform was terminated after he interviewed Musk. This comes just two months after X announced it was partnering with Lemon in a new content deal on the site. Lemon took to X yesterday to talk about what he says happened. Speaking of free speech, right, I thought the first person interview, no brainer, Elon Musk, the man who calls himself a free speech absolutist. I asked him to do it. He willingly agreed to the interview. Apparently, free speech absolutism doesn't apply when it comes to questions about him from people like me. Well, for more on this, we are joined by Vanity Fair special correspondent Brian Stelter. Brian, good morning. Let's start with what happened in this interview with Musk that got him unhappy enough to cancel Lemon's whole show. What details do we have? Right, we know that Don Lemon asked about reports of illegal drug use in Musk's past. Uh, we also know that uh, Don Lemon asked about uh, the rampant anti-Semitism that has erupted on X, formerly known as Twitter. You know, the thing about this interview is that Musk rarely grants interviews. He's happier on his own social network, replying to his fans, spreading far-right memes. And, and here's the other thing about Musk. He is undeniably a genius. His SpaceX company is about to launch a, you know, a bunch more uh, rockets, a bunch more satellites into space later today. But when it comes to X, his social network, he oftentimes steps on race. He spreads misinformation. He repels advertisers. And in this case, he's broken up a partnership that he said he needed. He, he's been trying to attract video creators to X. And in this case, He's broken up with one of them. So in a statement on X, Lemon says the interview will be available to watch next Monday on the site as well as YouTube. So a couple of questions here. How is X responding to what happened, all these developments yesterday? And then what is next for Lemon? Can this show still continue? Yeah, I think it will. I think the deal the Lemon worked out a multi-million dollar deal that was basically designed pretty quickly in order to make X sound more palatable to advertisers. X is out there in the marketplace trying to sign up more advertisers. It's been hard to do that because of all the content moderation problems, all the spam and pornography that fills up X. But Don Lemon signed on. He said he would do one exclusive show a week on X, and then he would do lots of other shows on YouTube and on podcasts, et cetera. So that's why Lemon Show is going to continue in various formats. But that X partnership, the advertiser partnership, that is gone kaput. Uh, you know, from X's point of view, they can make deals with whoever and whatever they want. And, and that's what they say. This is a, you know, a basic contract dispute. There was no actual signed contract yet, but they had a handshake agreement because X really needs video creators. Elon Musk says he wants X to be more like a YouTube platform, more of a video platform. But in order to do that, he needs lots of people to make videos. And this shows the tension when he might be too thin skinned to answer questions. It ends up, you know, canceling a relationship relationship with a content creator, I think it really shows the, the drama that's inherent in Elon Musk's relationship with his, uh, with his platform. Brian, what do you make of the fact also that, as Joe mentioned, they're saying it's still going to be available if he's so upset about this interview? Right. That, that's a good point. You know, Lemon's going to post the interview on his own, but he won't have that financial relationship with Musk anymore. And maybe ultimately that's a good thing because, you know, he can go off and do an interview whoever he wants. Uh, but it does show that Musk uh, says he commits, commits the freedom of speech, will let anything be posted on X as long as it doesn't break any laws. That is Musk's promise. I just think sometimes in the actual delivery, he, um, he, he reacts badly to criticism. And this is one of those cases where he just, you know, Don Lemon rubbed him the wrong way and he said, okay, we're breaking up. 
So it wasn't just a partnership with Don Lemon. X has also announced shows with former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, talk show host, sports talk show host Jim Rome. Of course, Tucker Carlson has a show there, too. What is the future right now for new content on this platform? Yeah, I think there still is a very interesting opportunity here when it comes to X in the same way that it's true on Facebook and YouTube and Twitch. When you can interact, when you can watch in real time with other people, when you can feel like you're part of a community, part of a uh, broader viewing community, there's a real opportunity there. So I, I wouldn't count X out. But, but I do think a situation like this shows that they can go out and make fancy promises. They can make grand announcements. They can make big promises to advertisers. But then if Elon Musk wakes up on the wrong side of the bed, all of that might go away. <laughs> Brian Stelter, we love when you join us. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks. Financial headlines now. Sportswear giant Under Armour has announced a leadership shakeup. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that. Another news. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning to you. Yeah, so Kevin Plank is retaking the helm of Under Armour. Plank founded the sportswear brand back in 1996 and ran it up until 2019 when he stepped down as CEO but remained chairman of the board. Under Armour enjoyed rapid growth for years under Plank, reaching about $5 billion in annual sales. But the business hit a wall in 2017 and has struggled to regain its footing in recent years. Plank joins a short list of companies whose founders returned as CEO, including Steve Jobs at Apple and Larry Page at Google. Meanwhile, Microsoft is moving to a single app for Teams that will allow you to easily switch between personal and work accounts. The new version, which is currently being tested, will roll out to commercial users next month. Now, in future updates, you'll also be able to choose the account you want to use when joining a meeting link or even join a meeting without having to sign in. And Pinterest has launched a new AI feature letting users filter search results by body type. It starts with a visual cue to select between four body type ranges. Now, the new tool is only available for women's fashion and wedding related items, but will expand to men's clothing later this year. And while it's hard to represent all body types, Pinterest says the tool will help make the site a more inclusive place, guys. I can't wait to try out that tool. It sounds pretty cool. Yeah, that's yeah. a great idea. All right, Silvana, yeah. thank you so much. Coming up, swiping left on dating apps. After the break, why some experts say younger Americans are starting to ditch those popular apps like Tinder and Match, and how the companies could possibly win users back. That's next. Stay with us. The developer says he has the funding to build America's tallest skyscraper in Oklahoma City. It would be called the Legends Tower, and it would stand at 1,907 feet. That's more than 100 feet taller than One World Trade Center wow. in Lower Manhattan. It'd be the center point of a $1.5 billion development, including a hotel and apartments. Developer Scott Madison told the Oklahoman the plans are now fully funded, but another developer called the tower fanciful. The city council is due to vote on the plan in June. Oklahoma City, who it's knew? It's lonely up there. <laughs> exactly. It will definitely stand <laughs> <Yeah>. out <laughs> there. But Interesting. Good for them. Okay. All right. Well, dating apps have loomed large in our love lives ever since the early 2010s. But could our love affair with them be at an end? Apps like Tinder and Bumble have been steadily losing their market value since 2021. Experts say younger generations are less willing to fork out the money for costly subscriptions. Yeah, I didn't even realize there were these subscriptions. Dr. Jess Carbino joins us for more on this. She's the former sociologist of Tinder and Bumble. Doctor, thanks for joining us. So why are these apps struggling to get people to pay for their services? Is it like a changing demographic or is some of this just that they're too expensive? I think it's fundamentally a demographic change. If you look at Gen Z as a population, which is what the media is most often discussing, Gen Zers are were born between the years 1997 and 2012. So legally, a very strong proportion of the individuals who fall within Gen Z are not even eligible to use the app because you have to be 18 years old to do so. Moreover, dating apps exist and are still fundamentally the number way 
one for one way individuals are meeting their romantic partners for long term partnerships. We also know that over half of individuals who are between the ages of 18 to 29, according to the Pew Research Center, are using online dating apps. But individuals who are between the ages of, you know, 15 and 27, which is really the primary demographic of individuals who are in Gen Z, are meeting partners outside of it. They're meeting people through in existing social institutions, like their local schools or through their neighborhoods because they're still living there. And dating apps really developed to help fill that gap. So it makes absolute sense that, you know, a kid who's in college is not paying for a dating app because they're able to meet people outside of it. And I think as with millennials, when these Gen Zers transition outside of educational institutions to meet romantic partners, because we know that the age at first marriage is not going to decline. If anything, it's going to continue to increase. We are going to see them returning and paying to dating apps for subscriptions. They're still using the apps. They are just not paying for them because they don't have that need yet. What is Gen Z looking for in the dating scene? Gen Zers are really looking to explore. We know that Gen Zers are a generation that is very curious. Um, they have a lot of questions as it relates to the authenticity of themselves and the authenticity of others. So I think that Gen Zers are using dating apps as a mechanism by which to discover and find themselves and others and to build community, which is something that we know Gen Zers really long for fundamentally. Can we also talk about the price tag on the league? I mean, this graphic that we have over here, $2.99 a month. I mean, what is it that apps need to do to win users back? You sound confident that Gen Zers will come back. What do they need to do? Well, I think that the price tag associated with other dating apps is incredibly reasonable. A lot of streaming services are approximately $20. And the satisfaction we get from streaming services, while high, is not in any way commensurate with what we find when we oh, are point. in a relationship with someone. And I think that individuals who are paying a real premium, like the league for $300, um, are really invested and are interested in finding people who are equally invested. And my research has shown that people think about um, whether or not individuals are paying when using a dating app. And you think of that payment as a signal of investment. So. It makes sense to me that a 22-year-old is not paying $300 uh, a month for a dating app because they don't need to. They're in college. And frankly, I think it's a good thing that they're mm. meeting people organically. Mm. But at the same time, I think that fundamentally, they are still using the dating apps. They are using dating apps in college, and they're meeting yeah. people organically, which is really important because when they're meeting people organically in college, they have the skills and background to mm -hmm. be able when they're, you know, in their late 20s and early 30s, like the millennials did, to communicate and form long lasting relationships on the dating apps, which yeah. I absolutely believe you will see happen. Dr. Jess Carbino, thank you so much. Some people may prefer their relationship with their streaming services. <laughs> right, we end this hour in the California Hills, where crowds are flocking to see the incredible displays of flowers, which they're hoping will be another super bloom. Those new to the area can learn more about the phenomenon with the help of a 40-year-old telephone hotline. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has the story. As spring emerges all around Southern California, the hills are alive with the sound of... Displays of San Verbena. Dune evening primrose. That's actor Joe Spano, seen on NCIS. Now we can do one of two things here. And in Apollo 13. Welcome. And heard on one of California's most quirky traditions, the wildflower hotline. What is it that gives you so much joy about being part of this hotline every year? There's no downside to beautiful flowers coming out of the ground. The weekly telephone hotline started 41 years ago by the Theodore Payne Foundation, a way for the group's botanists to let fellow flower enthusiasts find the best spring blooms. Pick up the phone and call. Yeah, just pick up the phone and call. I mean, there's something, <laughs> you know, charming about it, right? Now, getting to some of the most popular spots, like here in the Anza Borrego Desert, does require a drive. But for all these colors, folks say it's worth it. And this is just the start of the season. Experts say just wait. This year's rain could lead to another super bloom, like recent years in the Carrizo Plain and Antelope Valley. Imagine someone taking a paintbrush and just flinging paint across the hills. 
I'm glad we did this. <laughs> that vision is what brought Shandini Sharma all the way from Oklahoma, showing it off to her friend in India. It's just so beautiful and so colorful. So colorful. I dreamt of it all night. A simple yet extraordinary pleasure preserved by painters. You turn the other way. Photographers and a voice sharing this natural wonder with the world. We have the right conditions for an excellent wildflower viewing season. Liz Kreutz, NBC News, Los Angeles. It's really gorgeous. It's good for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now, though. Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for being with us this Thursday right now on Morning News Now back in court. Former President Trump is expected to attend a Florida hearing today on whether the criminal case involving his handling of classified documents should be thrown out. It comes as Mr. Trump has handed a boost in the Georgia election interference case where a judge has dismissed three criminal counts against him. We'll have the latest on Trump's legal turmoil. Also this morning, the clock is ticking for TikTok after the House passed a bill that would ban the popular social media app unless its Chinese parent company cuts it loose. I would say the choice is in TikTok's hands. I have no problem uh, with continued dance videos or even political campaigning on TikTok so long as the ownership structure changes. Why TikTok users are fighting back against the potential ban as the bill heads to the Senate. Speaking out, Olivia Munn and Christy Brinkley have revealed they're being treated for breast and skin cancer, respectively. Why both actors hope their stories will help others and what you need to know about these conditions. Plus, failure to launch, former CNN host Don Lemon says Elon Musk has canceled his new web-based show that was supposed to debut on the platform X. Why Musk is pulling the plug and how the decision could set the stage for a legal showdown. We begin this hour with the race for the White House and a busy day ahead on the campaign trail. President Biden is set to campaign later today in Michigan. That's an important battleground state that the president hopes to win again in November. Mr. Biden's opponent, former President Trump, making a very different stop. He's set to appear in a Florida courtroom today for a hearing in his classified documents case. This comes after a Georgia judge dismissed some of the charges against Trump yesterday in that state's election interference case. NBC News Chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander joins us from Milwaukee with all the latest. Peter, good morning. Hey, Joe and Savannah, nice to see both of you this morning. We, of course, have a long way to go in this presidential race, but it really does begin in earnest this week with both President Biden and former President Trump just clinching their party's respective nominations. And to give you a sense of the urgency here, President Biden is right now wrapping up what is his ninth visit to this key swing state of Wisconsin since taking office, while his predecessor, the former president, is off the trail this week, as you note, instead making his arguments in court. This morning with the general election fight off to the races, President Biden will campaign in Michigan while former President Trump returns to court in Florida as part of his classified documents case. I took him very legally and I wasn't hiding him. Mr. Trump praising the judge in his Georgia election interference case after he dismissed six of the 41 criminal counts against Mr. Trump and his co-defendants, including one charge involving Mr. Trump's phone call to Georgia's secretary of state pressuring him to overturn the results. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes. The judge found those counts lacked sufficient detail, but said prosecutors could refile them. Mr. Trump has pleaded not guilty. President Biden is hitting his second Midwest battleground in two days. First, Wisconsin, now Michigan where both races are expected to be highly competitive this fall. The president emphasizing his bipartisan success, investing in America's infrastructure. My predecessor talked about infrastructure week for four years. He didn't get a single thing done. But one key challenge, stubborn inflation. At Alley Boys Bagelry in Milwaukee, owners Ben Nierenhausen and Stacey Lopez have felt pressure from rising costs, but support President Biden's views on social issues like reproductive rights. I said I do feel a lot of the issues that he touches on are not just meant for today, but for future generations that he's not even going to see. In Waukesha County, Matt Leppard's Republican politics are on full display at his auto body shop. He says America needs four more years 
of Mr. Trump. I want my economy back. I want our national security back. I want our tax money to stay here. Also certain to make headlines today, Vice President Kamala Harris as an effort to sort of demonstrate the administration's commitment on the issue of reproductive rights today will visit a Planned Parenthood clinic that provides abortion services in Minnesota's Twin Cities. Joe and Savannah, this is a powerful and symbolic move. It'll also be, we believe, the first time a president or vice president has ever made such a visit while in office. Back to you guys. All right, Peter, thank you so much. Let's get more on the legal battles facing former President Trump with NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian. Hey, Ken, so you are outside the courthouse in Florida where a judge is expected to hear arguments on Trump's motions to dismiss the classified documents case against him. Walk us through what we can expect from today's hearings and the argument that's being made here. Good morning, Savannah and Joe. Well, we're told that Mr. Trump will be in the courtroom today as he was during the last motions hearing here in Fort Peace, Pierce. And Judge Aileen Cannon is expected to hear two of Donald Trump's many motions to dismiss this case today. One involves the Presidential Records Act, and another asserts that the Espionage Act, uh, which undergirds most of the charges in this case, is unconstitutionally vague. So in terms of presidential records, Mr. Trump is arguing that the Civil Presidential Records Act, uh, which governs how presidents uh, treat their records after they leave office, moots this prosecution. Essentially, he's saying that anything that he decided to take out of the White House automatically became a personal record and his property, and therefore the government cannot come after him because those records were classified. Now, obviously, the government says that's ridiculous and absurd and that he's trying to uh, act as if uh, because he was president, he's not subject to the same laws as everyone else. On the second motion, um, he's arguing that the 1917 Espionage Act um, is unconstitutionally vague, that some of the terms are not well defined. People have tried that before unsuccessfully. The Espionage Act has been used many, many times to prosecute people who have taken home classified information. Most recently, uh, notably Jack Teixeira, the airman in Massachusetts, who uh, is pleading guilty to uh, taking home and leaking massive amounts of classified information. So it'll be an interesting set of legal technical arguments today. And in fact, it's expected to last all day. And if passed as the guide, special counsel Jack Smith will be sitting in the courtroom behind his prosecutors who are arguing these matters. So, Ken, what are the possible outcomes here? How quickly do we expect the judge to make decisions? Joe, this judge moves methodically. I don't expect her to rule from the bench today. And she will probably issue written rulings at some point. We don't know when. Um, in terms of the outcomes, look, most legal experts say these claims by Mr. Trump are absurd and baseless. But Judge Aileen Cannon has, at different points during this case, entertained the idea that somehow because Donald Trump was president, uh, he, he, he gets special treatment. We saw that when she had a special master appointed to review material that was seized by the FBI at his house. A lot of people criticized that ruling, which was eventually overturned on appeal. So it wouldn't be surprising if she entertained particularly the Presidential Records Act issue. Uh, but the idea that she would dismiss these counts on, the, on those grounds considered very remote. Ken, we just have about a minute here, but I do want to ask you about the Georgia election interference case before we let you go. Uh, as we heard from Peter, a judge had dismissed three criminal counts against Trump. Walk us through what we saw there. Yeah, so this is not unusual, uh, and, and most of the counts survive. That's what's important. And only one felony conviction uh, is enough here in, in a case like this. But these are uh, counts involving uh, accusing Mr. Trump and others of um, uh, you know, pressuring local officials to violate their oaths to the Georgia and U.S. Constitution. And what the judge found is that the prosecutors did not allege specifically enough which parts of the Constitution uh, were allegedly violated. And so that was a fatal defect. Now, the prosecution can appeal, and so they may be reinstated, but as of now, they are out, guys. All right, Ken Delanian on a journey yeah. there in Florida. <laughs> Ken, thank you so much. <laughs> Was good. Well, turning now to Washington, where lawmakers are one step closer to potentially banning TikTok because they see it as a national security threat. The House passed a bipartisan bill yesterday that would require the popular app to be sold by its Chinese parent company or be banned in the U.S. President Biden says he supports the bill, but it now faces an uncertain future in the Senate. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig joins us now with the latest. Hey, Garrett, good morning.
Hey, Savannah, good morning. And yeah, that overwhelming bipartisan vote yesterday, along with how fast the vote happened at all in a Congress that does not do anything quickly, is a sign of lawmakers' concerns about what they believe are the national security risks of this popular video app used by more than 170 million Americans. But now TikTok's users are pushing back, and it's not clear what steps Washington or TikTok will take next. For social media giant TikTok, an uncertain future this morning as a bill calling for the company to split from its Chinese parent company or be shut down now heads to the Senate. The U.S. House on Wednesday in a rare and overwhelmingly bipartisan vote passing the measure that requires TikTok's parent company ByteDance to sell the app within six months. Republican Mike Gallagher wrote the bill. What do you say to people who just fundamentally don't understand why the app where they watch silly dance videos is a national security threat? The possibility for dangerous propaganda is too immense to allow one of our foremost adversaries to have this control over what is increasingly becoming the dominant news platform in America. Lawmakers and national security experts have long been concerned with ByteDance's ties to the Chinese Communist Party, which many believe can and does store data from American users. Partly because of a national security law that requires Chinese companies to share data and other information with the government. The reason that is valuable to the Chinese Communist Party is that the it begins to allow them to know how to influence Americans. In its annual threat assessment, the U.S. intelligence community says China used TikTok in the 2022 midterms, warning it could do so again in this fall's presidential election. TikTok has repeatedly denied any connections to the Chinese government, with the company's CEO responding to the House vote late Wednesday. We will continue to do all we can, including exercising our legal rights, to protect this amazing platform. Just 65 House members, mostly Democrats, oppose the bill. It's an overly broad bill that I don't think will withstand First Amendment scrutiny. Uh, the, the other issue is that there are a lot of people who make their livelihoods on this. Including creators like J.T. Labor. It is 100% of our income. Um, it's how I feed my wife and three children. Even some who support a divestment see a double-edged sword in an election year, with more than 20% of American voters using TikTok at least once a day. Cutting out a large group of young voters is not uh, the best known strategy for re-election. A lot of Savannah Sellers Easter eggs in that spot. So what <laughs> happens next? This bill will go to the Senate now where Leader Schumer says the Senate will review it. They don't appear to be in any hurry to do that. If the bill does get passed through the Senate, though, and signed by President Biden, it gives six months for this sale to occur. And that's without what would be an almost inevitable court challenge. So the bottom line here, I think, is that TikTok is not going anywhere anytime soon. Savannah? All right. Garrett Haig, thanks for sharing the hill with me yesterday. Good to see you. The escalating turmoil in Haiti is making it increasingly harder for Americans trapped in the chaotic country to leave safely. This morning, the U.S. military is sending in more Marines to ramp up security at the embassy there as gang violence overtakes the nation. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez is at Haiti's border in the Dominican Republic with the latest. Gabe, good morning. Hi there, Joan Savannah. Good morning. Well, right behind me, just across this gate, is Haiti's border. It's mostly closed, and it's a country essentially on lockdown. No flights in or out. And we're now learning more about the harrowing efforts to escape. This morning, as even more gang-fueled violence erupts in Haiti, a new team of U.S. Marines is on the ground in Port-au-Prince, securing the American embassy, the capital gripped by gunfire and chaos. It's been three days since Haiti's prime minister announced he would step down after relentless pressure from gangs who wanted him gone. Now efforts to stabilize the country may be stalling. Any delay could put the aid of a multinational police force led by Kenya and largely funded by the U.S. in jeopardy. With gangs controlling most of the capital, many civilians are now trapped. Haitian-American Cherie Bellhumer says she's hoping to escape Haiti and see her family in Miami, but there's no way to get there. They saying if we was to come back home to get our things, that day is going to kill us. Best-selling author Mitch Album now safe in Michigan after a stealth private helicopter mission in the middle of the night rescued him and staffers from an orphanage his charity runs. How harrowing was that escape? You know, the fear is that the gangs are going to shoot at the helicopters and the door closed and within 60 seconds we were up in the air in the dark and flying uh, and trying to get out, out of Haiti. 
The U.N. says a million Haitians are now on the brink of famine. Hospitals are struggling, too, desperate for generator fuel. We spoke with a doctor who says armed men executed a patient inside an ambulance. We are also seeing, uh, you know, patients who suffer from gunshot wounds the previous day who are only able to make it to our, our facility 12 hours later uh, when they feel safe. Missionary Jill Dolan and her family are trapped at a makeshift motel near the airport. She's frantically trying to get back to Florida in time for her daughter's wedding. But with the airport still shut down, she's instead ducking for cover. We did hear gunfire like right outside at this gate and it was very scary. And we hid in our room until it went away. As more Haitians flee the country, it could impact the border crisis back in the U.S. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is already bracing for an influx of Haitian migrants deploying more soldiers and drones to the state's southern coast. Joan Savannah. All right, Gabe, thank you so much. Well, this morning, Colorado is bracing for the worst winter storm to hit the state in three years. It comes as other parts of the country are experiencing tornadoes and unseasonably warm temperatures. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin is in Boulder, Colorado this morning with more. Hey, Dana, good morning. Hey, good morning to you, Savannah. This is just the beginning of that intense snowstorm. You can already see the wet, heavy rain falling, which could present a threat for downed trees and power lines. Denver forecasted to get more than a foot of snow in the metro area. The mountains could get up to five feet of snow, but officials here say they're ready. The biggest storm to hit Colorado in three years, arriving like a thief in the night quickly shifting from rain to heavy wet snow, falling at a rate of two to three inches per hour. Forecasters predicting when it's over, the snow will be measured in feet, not inches. The heavy snow creating treacherous roadways, stranding dozens of cars under blinding conditions on Interstate 70. And leaving semi-trucks completely stuck. Denver City officials calling this a rare tier four storm. The tier four level for us is heavy accumulation, major drifting potential. And with hundreds of flight cancellations already at Denver International, both Southwest and United Airlines are offering free rebookings for passengers flying to Colorado this week. While Colorado gets hammered with snow, California facing its own problems, a massive landslide destroying homes in this Los Angeles neighborhood, collapsing roofs and decimating yards. Fortunately, there were no injuries reported with several people evacuated. Other parts of the country are dealing with wild weather too. Overnight, South Central and Midwestern states facing severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, and golf-sized hail. The so-called gorilla hail creating dangerous conditions on the road, even cracking this truck's windshield. I was flustered. I really thought all the, the glass was gonna shatter in my truck. Tornado on the ground. We got tornado on the ground. These storm chasers capturing this massive tornado touching down in Alta Vista, Kansas. And from Oklahoma to New England, an unusual winter warm up with temperatures more than 15 degrees above normal, with many hoping it's a sign that spring may be around the corner. Now, this heavy, wet snow is expected to keep falling through Friday morning. And FlightAware is already reporting some 1,300 combined cancellations and delays. Officials warning people to stay home, stay off the roads, and stay safe. Savannah. All right, Dana, stay safe and go get warm at the Buff. Best breakfast in town. <laughs> While it's still winter out west, the East Coast gets a taste of spring-like weather. Angie Lastman's here with the forecast. Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Spring is definitely in the air for the East. We've got temperatures running more than 20 degrees above normal in some of these spots. Places like Cincinnati and St. Louis are going to be well into the 70s today. We've got Cleveland on tap to hit 67 degrees. Nashville and Little Rock, they're going to make it to the 80s. And the warmth will even continue into tomorrow, the closer you are to the east. We've got uh, Elizabeth City, Wilmington, Charleston all into the 80s tomorrow. New York will still be running well above normal with a temperature of 64 degrees and Washington DC is expected to hit 76. By the time we get into the weekend, things will start to kind of moderate out. So you can see places like Detroit going from the upper 50s on Saturday to the 30s by Monday, a bit of a reality check if you ask me. We've got New York into the upper 50s for Saturday and Sunday and we are back to the low 50s by Monday. And this is the general trend we'll see even in places like St. Louis going from the 60s to the 40s in a matter 
of a couple of days. So spring not settling in permanently just yet, but we will enjoy those mild temperatures for a little while longer. Meanwhile, you heard Dana talk about some of those storms that we saw yesterday. Kansas City really bearing the brunt of that with some of that hail, and now they continue to charge on. These lines of thunderstorms prompting a thunderstorm watch that's going to last until noon central time across these regions, parts of Illinois and Missouri included in that. Uh, you can see St. Louis dead center in that watch, and this is why. We've got the storm system working to the east. We're going to expect not just the thunderstorms possible in that region through noon, but even into the afternoon and evening hours, we're going to watch this area. You can see a big chunk of the country from the Midwest down to the plains that has the potential to see some of those strong to severe storms later today. Our biggest concern is going to be the large hail, kind of like what we saw yesterday, two inches or larger is possible. We'll see those wind gusts and maybe a couple of tornadoes too. And the system not done just yet, even as we get into tomorrow, we'll still see that cold front moving uh, as we get into the afternoon hours tomorrow and bringing the potential for some strong storms yet again. It's a smaller area, mainly across portions of southern Texas. Still, those threats will remain, especially the large hail that we're going to watch into the afternoon and evening hours. And the rocky snow continues. <laughs> Five million people under these winter alerts. We've got the heavy snow happening. Colorado, De Colorado Springs, Denver, uh, Boulder, all picking up some additional snow. The largest totals are going to be mainly in the isolated areas of the Front Range. I think um, few and far between. We'll see four feet. But still, places like Denver, 9 to 18 inches. We're expecting evergreen, anywhere from 28 to 36 inches. That is a lot of snow. <laughs> Even for Colorado, which, yeah. by the way, March is their snowiest month. So right, and it'll be like crazy. 75 okay. degrees in three days, probably. Exactly. There. <laughs> yes, the flip-flop is insane there. Angie, thank you. Of course. Coming up, after days of speculation over Princess Kate's edited photo, Prince William is back in the spotlight tonight at an event honoring his late mother. The tribute William will be paying to Princess Diana and the role his brother, Prince Harry, will also have. That's all next. Welcome back. Both Prince William and Prince Harry are set to make appearances at a memorial event for their mother, Princess Diana. It will put the Prince of Wales back into the public spotlight just days after his wife posted that edited photo, which led to a wave of questions about the royal family. NBC News international correspondent Molly Hunter has the latest from London. And as the questions keep coming, we've actually just learned that we will see both brothers, Prince William and Prince Harry, at this same event tonight. And the legacy of their mother, Diana, is top of mind. Take a look. This morning, on two different continents, both Prince William and Prince Harry preparing for a royal event near to their hearts. The Legacy Awards tonight in London, put on by the Diana Award nonprofit in honor of their late mother. Back in 2017, both brothers were there in person for the inaugural event. And tonight, Prince William will present the awards, giving a short speech. And later, Prince Harry will speak with the recipients separately and virtually to celebrate their accomplishments. This comes as Prince William carries on with public royal duties as Kensington Palace stays mum on Kate. But the late Princess of Wales' legacy looms large as the current Princess of Wales stays out of sight. In recent years, Prince Harry has spoken frequently about the threat of media attention, of course, leading to his move to the States with his family. Rarely do we have a holiday without someone with a camera, you know, jumping out of a bush or something. Within the family, within the system, the advice that's always given is don't react, don't feed into it. And on this side of the pond, Kensington Palace has been clear. Kate will recuperate in private. There will be no rolling health updates. William regards the media with suspicion. I, I think his instinct is to try to keep a lid on things as much as possible. The, the problem is that if you go back to the age of Diana, life was so simple. There wasn't this nightmarish social media thing in the middle. As the headlines waned days after that photo was posted, the Sun implored readers to lay off Kate and the Daily Mail today, give Kate a break. The public and the media do not have the intense interest in the king uh, that they do in the Princess of Wales, Kate. She's a different matter for them altogether. 
Now, as you heard Tim just say right there, it is so interesting watching how Buckingham Palace is dealing with King Charles. Of course, he is undergoing cancer treatment right now, but they feel a responsibility to show the 75-year-old monarch to the public. Just this week, we've received numerous photos of the king performing state duties. Kensington Palace clearly has a very different approach. I'll send it back to you. All right, Molly, thank you. Let's get you more international headlines now, starting with the latest show of force by North Korea's leader. NBC's Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and other world news. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, guys. That's right. State media in North Korea is reporting that the leader Kim Jong-un has joined his troops while they were training to operate a new type of battle tank. Now, the Korean Central News Agency said that during the training, the North Korean leader mounted one of the tanks and drove it himself and later called the new, the new tank the world's most powerful. Now, the training is seen as a response to the annual joint military drills by South Korea and the U.S., which lasted 11 days and are expected to end today, which North Korea sees as a rehearsal for invasion. Let's go to India, where thousands of farmers traveled to the capital New Delhi on buses and trains to push their demand for a guaranteed minimum profitable crop prices. Initially, the farmers were planning to drive their tractors into the capital, but the authorities blocked all access to the city using cement blocks and barbed wire. The farmers then decided to take public transport to join the rally, where they also said they, they also asked the government to keep its promises to waive loans and withdraw legal cases brought against them during the 2021 protests. And let's end this tour of the world in Australia, where the first male professional soccer player to come out as gay in a main league has proposed to his partner. Josh Cavallo, who plays for the Australian team Adelaide United, made history in 2021 when he came out with an emotional online video vowing to change the sports culture to show, and I quote, that everyone is welcome in the game of soccer. Today, he posted a picture of him going down on his knee on his home pitch at the mm -hmm. Coopers Stadium. And given the photos of the emotional reaction of his fiancée, looks like he said yes. Congratulations <laughs> to both. Okay, to I hope so. You see the ring on, so I think he accepted it. Oh, that's so sweet. Claudia, Congrats thank you so much. <laughs> Coming up, Olivia Munn and Christy Brinkley sharing their cancer diagnoses. Why the two women are speaking out and what you need to know about their conditions up next. We're back now with a story about two celebrities revealing their cancer diagnoses on social media. Both Olivia Munn and Christy Brinkley shared the news on Instagram yesterday. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk has that story. Doctors say the key to beating cancer is catching it early. Olivia Munn and Christy Brinkley would agree. Both women are sharing stories about their cancer diagnoses, hoping what they've gone through will remind people to make those appointments and get those exams. On the red carpet at the Oscars this weekend, Olivia Munn and her partner John Mulaney held hands and smiled for the cameras. No sign of the serious health battle the 43-year-old actress has been waging. Munn announcing Wednesday she was diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer in both breasts last April and underwent a double mastectomy. Writing on Instagram, I went from feeling completely fine one day to waking up in a hospital bed after a 10-hour surgery the next. Munn, who many know from her role on HBO's The Newsroom, writes, I'm lucky we caught it with enough time that I had options. She says Dr. Thais Ali Abadi saved her life when she did a breast cancer assessment. Munn's score was high, 37 percent, according to the actress's post. What does that 37 percent mean? In her case, 37.3 percent was her lifetime risk for breast cancer. And the way I explain it to my patients, if you had a 37 and a half percent chance of boarding a plane that would crash, would you ever board that plane? Dr. Ali Abadi sent her for a breast MRI. And that's when they discovered the cancer. Olivia says that she wasn't going to be going in for another mammogram for a year. What would have happened in that year, potentially? Her cancer would have grown. She had an aggressive cancer. Along with thanking her doctor, Mun thanked Mulaney. The couple have a son together. I'm so thankful to John, she writes, for being there before I went into each surgery and being there when I woke up. And for placing framed photos of our little boy Malcolm by her hospital bed. Also sharing a cautionary tale, actress and model Christy Brinkley, who posted photos of the procedure she had to remove skin cancer from her face. Like Munn, she writes, the good news for me is we caught the basal cell carcinoma early. 
Brinkley adding, I was lucky to find mine because I was accompanying one of my daughters to her checkup. In her post, she reminds people to get regular total body checkups and slather up with sunscreen. Two different women, each with scary personal stories to tell and important health messages they hope will help others. Frankly says she had a little dot on the side of her face and just asked the doctor to take a look. In her words, he knew right away. A reminder that doctors can sometimes identify a problem very quickly. As for Olivia Munn, she has a lot of support around her. Her partner, John Mulaney, commenting on her announcement post, saying, thank you for fighting so hard to be here for us, Malk, and I adore you. Back to you. All right, Stephanie, thank you so much. Let's dig in more on this issue of breast cancer in younger women. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel. Doctor, good morning. So in just a minute, I'm going to ask you another question about kind of how this was actually found, because I think a lot of people are like, what does that mean? And can I ask for that? But first, let's just start with the details. Olivia Munch, she's just 43 years old. How common is it to see breast cancer among women who are under 45 and who is at that higher risk of being diagnosed at a younger age? Yeah, Savannah, great questions. Look, one in eight women or people who identify as women will get breast cancer. Anyone with breast can get breast cancer. Of those one in eight, one in 10 of those breast cancer patients will be under the age of 45. So about 9% of breast cancer patients are mm -hmm. under the age of 45, which might shock a lot of people because that does seem young. Risk factors, very briefly, any genetic history, Not m most people think it's just with mothers or the mother's line, that's not true. The father's line, anyone in the relative's pool that can have breast cancer can put you at risk. Having children in an older age, that includes me. I calculated my own breast cancer risk. We'll talk about that in a second. And then other certain characteristics of breasts, women with dense breasts, women with genetic markers. There are other factors that can contribute to that increased risk. What are the signs women do need to be most aware of? Yeah, the signs can be incredibly broad, but Joe, I would use an overall framework, and you heard a little bit of it with Olivia and Christie's story, anything that seems off. So women can have very dense breasts, and it can sometimes worry them, but it's always very important, even at an incredibly young age, Joe, to make sure that you have that, they talk about a total body exam, or Christy Brinkley did. I think it's very important to make sure that not just a proper breast exam is done, but I encourage women to understand how their own breasts feel and how that can change with periods and different times in their life after they've given birth. So sometimes skin changes, dense breasts, all of these changes can be signals. But then sometimes, like in Olivia Munn's case, there could be no symptoms. Doctor, so let's talk through this breast cancer assessment. And in the piece, it says that right. Olivia's score was high. What does that yeah. look like? Is, should you be asking your doctor for that? At what age can anyone get that number and have a plan of action? Yeah, I'm going to recommend people go to an organization that I started working with when I was a medical student, the Susan G. Komen Foundation. It's easy to remember their website, komen.org, K-O-M-E-N dot O-R-G. And they have an incredible, robust description. They've got very good advice. And they have this breast cancer risk assessment tool. I took it myself just again this morning to prepare for this. I personally have a 5.5% lifetime average risk of getting breast cancer, and wow. it's elevated because of some of those risk factors. I want everybody here, men included, because men too can get breast cancer. Uh, anybody with breast can get breast cancer. So I want people to go to that homen.org. They can get that tool as well. Dr. Kavita Bittal, great, great actionable advice. Thank you so much. Well, coming up, Elon Musk pulls the plug on Don Lemon's new web-based show before it even launches on X. Why Musk canceled the show and the feud now ignited between them. That's next. Back with the latest chapter in the saga of this year's chaotic college admission season, which left thousands of students in limbo. As the New York Times reported last week, the U.S. Education Department discovered 70,000 unread emails from students all over the country containing essential information. So it just days until a processing deadline, just 200 department employees, including the nation's top student aid official, had to read through all those emails to ensure those students got the financial help they needed. It's just the latest challenge the Education Department has faced since Congress ordered the new version of the free application for federal student aid, also known as FAFSA. Joining us now for more on this story, New York Times associate reporter Zach Montague. Zach, thanks for joining us. So first of all, just explain how this huge number of emails went undiscovered, and then what's the impact of that on student applications this year? Thanks, good to be with you. Um, so the emails that have 
uh, we've uncovered here were actually from students that couldn't provide a social security number for either themselves or a parent or a contributor when they filled out the form originally. And that's actually a pretty egregious burden for a lot of students that are already overcoming a number of disadvantages in accessing college. And uh, you know, out of those 70,000, the department realized that you know, uh, all of them had uh, failed to fill this in and were now facing the prospect of uh, missing out and had asked them to send in an identification that they could use to verify their identity. Uh, upon discovering this, uh, this set off a fire drill for the department to race through this backlog and uh, try to verify all of these by hand. Let's go back to the rollout of this newest version of FAFSA. You actually wrote that a series of blunders by the department, from a haphazard rollout to technical meltdowns, plunged the most critical stage of the college admissions season into disarray. I mean, it really sounds like a nightmare. Tell us about this new version of this application and what it is about it that's caused so many problems. Well, it's been a three-year process to build this new form, which, as you know, is a pretty critical tool for students and their families who are trying to uh, get federal aid uh, to go to college. And uh, the department had, like I said, three years to to put this together. But over the last six months, normally the form would be out in October. That was delayed until December. Uh, the department then announced a soft launch where the form wasn't available to everyone all at once, but just sort of came out periodically in bursts that was not uh, previously announced to students. So uh, since then, since December, students have sort of found themselves panicking, trying to get these forms into the department, which by this time of year is really supposed to be processing the data that comes in, sending that out to schools so that colleges across the country can come up with their own estimates of how much tuition students can pay. So we're just behind the ball on all of this this year. You know, the schools themselves don't know how much uh, they can tell accepted students that they're going to end up paying for college. Students don't know what sort of aid packages they can expect. Uh, how you know they can't weigh different different offers from different schools. So it's not really clear to them. So everyone's had to push back. And we're now moving into the the spring where by now a lot of people would know where they're going to school, how much they're going to pay. And we're seeing deadlines push back uh, well into April, in some cases into May for uh, for both the, the universities that are scrambling to get this all figured out and uh, for students that are just waiting to hear what they can expect. All right, Zach Montague, thanks so much for joining us this morning, and thanks for your reporting. Appreciate it. Thank Let's you. Let's get you financial headlines now, starting with some new economic data and the latest read on unemployment. CNBC's Savannah Hanau has that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Savannah. Good morning. Yeah, we're getting a, f uh, a fresh view on the health of the economy. Jobless claims. That's the number of Americans applying for jobless benefits last week. It did inch up, but largely stayed at historically low levels as the labor market continues to thrive despite those elevated interest rates. The number coming in at 209,000. It was expected that we would get 218,000. Meanwhile, retail sales up 0.6% in February. February, we were expecting a 0.8% uptick. That's bouncing back from a January retreat, showing the resilience of consumer spending. Our former President Trump has reportedly discussed choosing hedge fund billionaire John Paulson for Treasury Secretary if he wins re-election in November. Bloomberg says the conversations so far have been informal and preliminary. Paulson hosted a fundraiser for Trump at his home in Palm Beach last month. Other names potentially in the mix include former U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Jeff Yass, who is the founder of private equity firm Susquehanna and an investor in TikTok's parent company, ByteDance. And it's time to celebrate pi, the mathematical number that represents the circumference of a circle. Today is Pi Day, and several restaurants and retailers have some great deals. 7-Eleven customers can get any large pizza for $3.14 if they're members of the 7 Rewards program. You can get a free Hershey's Sunday Pie at Burger King with a purchase of at least $3.14. Online food platform Gold Belly is offering 31.4% of all pies today, guys. So lots to choose from. All right. <laughs> Happy so pie sweet, day. the savory, all the pies. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just days before premiering, former CNN anchor Don Lemon says his new X-based talk show 
show has been canceled. Lemon says Elon Musk pulled the plug on the show after being interviewed by him in the first episode of the series. NBC News Business and Data correspondent Brian Chung joins us with more on what happened. Hey, Brian, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Savannah. That's right. It was supposed to be part of the next chapter for the two high-profile men. So you, Lemon launching a new show after being fired from CNN and Musk bringing exclusive content to his recently purchased platform X. But just 24 hours after Lemon interviewed Musk for what was supposed to be the launch of that very show, he says it all came crashing down with a text that said, contract is canceled. Lemon appearing on CNN to explain what happened. This morning, a high-profile deal between two unlikely partners imploding. After a confrontational interview between former CNN anchor Don Lemon and Elon Musk turned tense during a taping of the new The Don Lemon Show that was supposed to debut next week on Musk's platform X. Lemon pushing the billionaire behind ventures like SpaceX and Tesla for allowing tweets that endorse anti-Semitism and conspiracy theories. Hate speech on the platform is up. Do you believe that X and you have some responsibility to moderate hate speech on the platform? That you wouldn't have to answer these questions from reporters about the Great Replacement Theory as it relates to I don't to have to answer these questions. The Great Replacement Theory as it relates to Jewish people. Do you think that... I don't have to answer questions from reporters. Don, the only reason I'm doing this interview is because you're on the X platform and you asked for it. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I would not do interview with this interview. The interview also covering topics like Musk's depression and drug use as well as the businessman's recent conversations with former President Donald Trump. Did he ask you for money? He didn't. Hours later, Lemon says he received a short text from Musk that read, contract is canceled. They were a, a distribution partner, so he never was my boss. He never had any editorial control of the show. Musk firing back in a post on X, saying the show's approach was basically just CNN, but on social media, which doesn't work. X's own account online defending its right to terminate the relationship, but adding, quote, the Don Lemon show is welcome to publish its content on X without censorship. The move reigniting arguments about the balance of free speech and misinformation on the platform. Free speech is meaningless unless you allow people uh, you don't like to say things you don't like. As for Lemon, he was fired from CNN last year following controversial comments about women, including then-Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley, that were seen as sexist and ageist. Nikki Haley is in her prime, sorry. When a woman is considered to be in her prime in her 20s and 30s and maybe 40s. Lemon publicly apologized for those comments, and a spokesperson for Lemon tells NBC News he still expects to be paid for the partnership, but an ex-representative says there was no signed agreement between the Don Lemon show and X, setting the stage for a potential legal showdown. As far as the interview, Lemon says it will post on Monday on YouTube as well as X. So, guys, this may be far from over. Yes. At least we'll see what happened. Yeah. All right, Brian, thank you so much. Coming up, we are raising the curtain on one of the most powerful new shows on Broadway. Two of the stars from Days of Wine and Roses are here to talk about the show that's got critics excited. That is up next. Welcome back. We have a cute one for you. Workers at a Virginia Wildlife Center found a unique way to stop a newborn fox from becoming too used to humans. Take a look at this. Founder Melissa Stanley and her team wore this fox mask while feeding milk to the little animal. Now, it's not just cute. It's got a purpose here. It was designed to prevent what is known as imprinting. That is where newborns form a strong bond with the first animal who cares for them. The baby fox weighed less than three ounces when it was found. After it has been rehabilitated at the Richmond Wildlife Center, workers will try to unite it with its real mom. Isn't that cool, Joe? That is cute, but the fox may also have a, a like, really into Muppets now or something like that. I'd be a little scarred. This is a real exactly. fox, but good nonetheless. Interesting idea. All right, cool. Thanks, Savannah. Let's end the hour with a curtain call. Your front row ticket to some of the hottest shows on Broadway and beyond. This morning, we are thrilled to welcome two Broadway legends, Kelly O'Hara and Brian and Darcy James. They star in the new musical Days of Wine and Roses, which is based on a 1958 teleplay and 1962 film of the same name. It's about a couple in New York in the 1950s falling in love and forming a family while wrestling with alcohol addiction. The show has earned rave reviews. The New York Times branded it a critic's pick, calling the performances superb and those superb performances. <laughs> Performers join us now. Congratulations on the show. It is 
so incredibly powerful. It, Kelly, it's, it's maybe not a topic that naturally lends itself to a musical, but I understand this is like an idea you had many years ago while working with Brian. Tell us where the idea came from to do this show. Yeah, you know, I think of music as, uh, I love musical dramas. You know, we think of musical theater often and put it in the comedy category, which I love as well. But um, I'm also from the opera world a little bit. I got my degree in that. And so I really love uh, taking a story to the next step with music. And so when I thought about this one, some of the unspoken things about this particular situation lend themselves well to being musicalized. And, um, you know, so I asked Adam Gettle, who wrote The Light in the Piazza, which is another show I did, around 2002. We had just finished this show called Sweet Smell When you Success. were a teenager. When I was three. <laughs> um, I said, what about, what about musicalizing this show for Brian and me? And, and we... He liked the idea, and gosh, it, it took a while, but here we are. Here you are. And, and also people did comment on the fact that they thought you look like Lee Remick, you look like Jack Lemmon, who were in the original movie. That helped too, didn't it? Uh, yeah, you know, the imagination can... Uh... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Clearly this is a lot about how much you love working with each other. What is it about your just relationship on stage that clicks so much, Brian? Well, you know, like Kelly said, we, we did this, this great show 20, some 20 years ago, and that's how we really kind of forged our, our friendship and our working relationship. And over those 20 years, we've never really done a show, a proper show uh, like that, uh, a Broadway show. Uh, we've done recordings, we've done concerts, we've done readings. So we've, we've definitely been each, in each other's, um, you know, uh, orbit as friends and colleagues and so when this started kind of bubbling up it was um it was great and i will say that that doing the show every night with kelly and seeing your friend and seeing also uh, i'm a fan of kelly's uh so to be able to see the work that she's doing um in this show in particular is is thrilling because uh, it's i don't know it's something that i've never seen her do and i think audiences haven't seen her do as well so it is a um it's it's kind of a, a, um, a t two things. It's it's cheering your friend on and just being so proud of your friend, but also knowing that you're in the company of of greatness. And and so this 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 kind of relationship that we have on stage is one that I've never experienced before in terms of the characters and how they bounce off each other. And the audience really can feel it. This is obviously not a high energy pop show. Talk about the music and how do you get that tone just right? You know, um, both Craig Lucas, our book writer, and Adam Gettle uh, are just extraordinary at telling specifically very human stories. You know, these people, I think some people feel the show so deeply and dramatically because it feels so human. It doesn't feel sort of like an archetype of a, a person, but yet you're getting to know these two people very deeply and intimately. And so it's really on the page. You know, the, the, the music is underneath us sort of swelling, the words that we say. Um, but the tone is also what Brian was saying. This is a personal and professional sort of collaboration of, of safety, friendship, trust. Um, we, we are very much not these people. And yet, um, if we bring ourselves to the table um, in the trusted way that we are together, um, the tone kind of, it, it, it works for itself. It just sort of takes us and goes. And, and, um, but I really lean on that great material. You know, it's already there for us if we just trust it. Can I add to also, in terms of tone, I mean, we have an incredible director in Michael Greif, who mm -hmm. his job is basically to see what's happening with every element of the production, our performances, the company's performances, the physical aspects of it, how it moves, how everything is is um, presented and uh, it ultimately is delivered. So his eye, uh, not only in you know speaking personally, his ability to kind of monitor and calibrate what we're doing to... To, to have the story kind of reveal itself in the proper way, mm -hmm. um, that takes an expert eye, and we have that in Michael. So that, that I think, in terms of tone, I think that is um, our ace in the hole. One of the best directors out there. Mm -hmm. And he's got about 17 Broadway shows. I was shows. about to say, he is a busy man this <laughs> yes. season. Google it. Um, yeah. Alcohol addiction, I mean, it is an issue that affects nearly every family. What are you hearing from people who see this show? Do they talk about that and the impact that, that this has on them and the impact your show then has on them? We've had, I'm, I've had the most amazing conversations of my career um, with all people, but especially I'm finding with young people. We have a generation now which is the first sober curious generation ever. Um, 
we, we know so much more about alcoholism now. We know so much more about um, the different programs one might go into it if, if they suffer from alcoholism. At this time in, in our show, nobody knew about this. And so now we're talking to people who lived through it, children of people who've lived through it, people who are attached to it. Um, there are some people who come and have a, uh, really see the hope and the joy in the show. Um, there is a lot of that, talk about tone. There's, there's a lot of different things happening because it's a human life that we're talking about, two, three, four human lives in our show. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that, um, I, I think that the, the conversations about what it, how it affects people are so different and vast that it's making me feel like I'm doing one of the more purposeful things of my career, you know? Yeah. Brian, we have like 15 seconds left here, but anything else you want to add to that? Well, just um, the idea that when we do get to meet people and they, and they have a reaction that whether it's their own experience dealing with addiction or their, their relatives, having that interchange and that kind of um, recognition is something that is very, very powerful, and, and I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. It's, it's, we're, we're doing our job, and, and the message is the show is getting across. Very good. All right, Kelly O'Hare, Brian Darcy, James, thank you both. And you can catch Days of Wine and Roses at Studio 54 through March 31st. That is going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Great interview. The news continues right now. Stay with us. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.